30 hours ago I hopped on a late night flight from New York heading to Los Angeles. After boarding I saw that I had an entire row to myself, take off pass without incident, and soon I was stretched out for a nap across the row. I slept for a few hours, I don't know how long, but I woke up to some severe turbulence. It's possible that the lights in the cabin went out for a moment, but I was so disoriented that it's hard to say. I checked my phone to see that it was 4.03 in the morning, which I figured gave me about an hour until we landed. When I looked out my window, I was shocked to see nothing but wide open ocean. My jaw dropped. There's obviously no ocean between New York and Los Angeles. I hit the button to call the flight attendant and spent the next few minutes racking my brain for a lake that could have been possibly big enough to explain what I was seeing. I jumped when the attendant flipped off the light. She was grinning from ear to ear and tears were pouring down her cheeks. How can I help you sir? She asked. I froze for a moment at her reaction before deciding to just ask my question. Where are we? Why does it look like we're flying over an ocean? She wiped her cheeks to clear the tears, still grinning. Sir, we'll be landing in about an hour. I, uh, okay, thank you, I said. After she left I checked the clock on my phone again. 4.03 blinked back at me. The time didn't change. I had to have been waiting with my call light on for at least 5 minutes. How was it possible that it hadn't changed at all? I opened up my laptop top and saw it too displayed 4.03 am. I pulled out my phone, started a stopwatch in the app, and spent the next two hours looking back and forth between the clocks, waiting for them to change. They never did. I tapped the shoulder of an older woman sitting in the row ahead of me. She looked back, an annoyed expression across her face. Yes, she asked. Do you know how long until we land? I asked. She narrowed her eyes. That flight attendant said it would be about another hour. I shook my head in confusion. That flight attendant. We talked almost two hours ago. We should have landed already. She stared at me as if I was crazy. I was going to continue trying to convince her, but I felt a hand on my shoulder. I spun to see a male flight attendant, grinning down at me, tears painting off his cheeks onto my shoulder. Sir, I'm going to ask you to calm down, or I'll be calling the captain. I told him that wouldn't be necessary, and sat back. He removed his hand and stepped away. The flight attendants continued to stop by every few hours offering meals. My stopwatch continued to tick up and is now telling me that I've been on this plane for more than 30 hours. I've explored all of coach and tried talking to some of the other passengers, but they've all told me that they're expecting to land in an hour or so. Around three hours ago, I tried getting into first class. I made it past the curtain but was escorted back by two grinning flight attendants. Their grip on my arms were like iron. Sir, the seatbelt sign is on, one said. Please remain in your seat with your buckle fastened. We'll be landing in about an hour. I'd just about given up hope when a woman came down the aisle dressed in a business suit. She didn't look at me or slow down, but she dropped a piece of paper onto my tray as she made her way to the bathrooms at the back of the plane. I shot a look around before unrolling it. It said, are you stuck too? I pulled out a pen and wrote yes. It's been 30 hours. I folded the scrap of paper up and set it on the tray closest to the aisle. She left the bathroom and picked it up as she passed. It's been 20 minutes since then. I don't know why, but I don't think the flight attendants would like it if they knew we were talking. It doesn't matter. I have to do something. I'll update you all with whatever happens next. A few hours after the businesswoman picked up her piece of paper with my message, she came back down the aisle and sat in the seat beside me. She bent over, trying to stay low. So, you're stuck too? She asked. I kept my voice low. Yeah, my name's Jack, by the way. I'd say nice to meet you, but... She nodded. I'm Mary. You're wrong. Getting your message was by far the best thing about the past day. I've spent the last day and a half thinking I was alone in this. She paused for a moment, looking up the aisle. When she spoke again, her voice was a whisper. So, Jack, you have any theories on what the hell's going on? I considered lying but decided the truth was for the best. I think we might be dead. Mary shook her head. Maybe if it were just me or just you. If this was some cosmic train to hell, why would there be two of us who realize what going on. No idea. Mary pulled out her phone and handed it to me. It displayed the Wikipedia article for flight MH370, the airline that disappeared in 2014. I read through that article carefully. There were dozens of theories trying to explain what happened. 
They range from hypoxia to suicide to aliens. Doesn't tell us much, I said. Not much other than that this may have happened before, she said. How about you? Any theories as to why anyone else can't see what's going on? We talked it over and realized one thing we had in common was that we were both fast asleep at 4.03 a.m. There's no way we were the only ones asleep at that time though. Maybe everyone else was just napping. I don't know about you, but I was well and truly asleep. The cabin lights flicked off and a dozen red emergency lights in the floor flicked on, casting the cabin in a red glow. The intercom crackled to life saying, Passengers, please return to your seats. The seatbelt sign is fastened and we may experience some turbulence. We'll be landing in about an hour. Mary froze. Should I go back? She asked. Maybe they won't notice if you're gone, but maybe they already know and they're just trying to separate us. Mary nodded. We should stay together. That's a better idea. The intercom crackled again. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to announce the arrival of the captain. We'll all be given the opportunity to speak with him. Please remain in your seats until he calls you. If you need assistance, don't worry. A flight attendant will happily help you on your way. Sounds of passengers getting to their feet echoed from further up in the plane. We sat in silence, trying to get a look through the curtain separating us from first class. The captain, I asked, no idea, but it didn't sound like they were talking about a pilot to me, did they? Nope. That's when a pungent sulfur smell hit us, so strong that I had to resist the urge to gag. It reminded me of the worst rotting eggs I'd ever smelt in my life. But the old woman sitting ahead of us didn't react. She just kept watching a movie on the back of her seat. Don't cough, I said to Mary. We fought it for a few long seconds before giving in, coughing hard and violently. A second later the curtain opened. Mary and I froze, staring down the now red fuselage. Four flight attendants passed through the curtain and made their way down the rows towards us, grins stretched wide across their faces. They were still crying, but this time the tears streaking their faces were darker. It's hard to say with the lighting, but it looked like blood. My eyes were drawn to them though. I looked over their shoulders at the figure standing near the front of the plane. It was a black silhouette standing beside the cockpit door. It was at least eight feet tall and pointing towards us with a single finger. It had called us the bathrooms. I shouted. We ran towards the back of the plane, the flight attendants closing in behind us. Blood dripped from their grinning cheeks onto the carpet of the plane. The captain is here, he said in a perfect customer service voice. His grin widened as he moved towards us. We made it to the bathrooms, jumping into opposite sides. I slid slammed the door shut and locked it, pressing my feet against the folding center part of the door to keep it closed. They began banging on the door and pulling at the handle while I fought to keep it closed. I'm sorry, but you'll both need to speak with the captain, one of the flight attendants said. Jack. Mary screamed. Jack. Help. A distinct snapping sound like breaking metal came from her bathroom. She continued to scream as the sounds of struggle migrated up towards the front of the plane, towards the black figure I'd seen. I'd like to say I jumped out and fought them, that I distracted them or did something heroic. I didn't. She was carried away, and a few short seconds later her screaming was cut off. That was a few hours ago, and I'm still locked inside this bathroom. I keep trying not to think of what they've done with her. The thing at the front of the plane didn't seem human. I hope it didn't kill her, not after she was shouting for my help like that. I couldn't take that. I haven't heard any movement outside in a few hours, but I'm terrified to open the door. I'm far from the seat outlet so my phone's almost dead and I haven't eaten in way too long. If I go out there, will the flight attendants remember? What if that thing is still waiting for people? I don't have much time to make a decision, but I'll update you all here with what happens next. After another dozen hours or so, I opened the bathroom door. The lights in the cabin were back to normal and I couldn't smell any sulfur. I cautiously made my way back to my seat and almost cried when the grinning crying flight attendant came by offering a meal. That crappy airline food was the most delicious thing I'd ever eaten. When I'd finished, my mind immediately turned to Mary. What had happened to her? I crept down the aisle towards first class, trying to keep a low profile. Surprisingly, the flight attendants were nowhere to be seen. They'd almost seemed to ignore me, almost as if they wanted me to find her. She had a row to herself and was staring down at her phone in the window seat. 
I slid into the aisle and shook her arm. Mary, I hissed. She pulled out her headphones and stared at me with a surprised expression. Yeah, what's going on? Are you okay? I asked. What did that thing do to you? What did they do to you? I'm sorry, remind me how I know you. What do you mean? We just... I realized with sinking horror that she had no idea who I was. I fought back tears. Mary, how long have you been on this flight? She checked the watch on her wrist. Well, it's 4.03 a.m., so a few hours at least. She stared at me the same way you'd look at a person claiming they were the second coming of Christ. Her tone was low and reassuring. Hey, don't worry so much. Look on the bright side. We'll be landing in about an hour. I felt an iron grip on my arm and looked up to see two flight attendants. Sir, this area is for first class passengers only. They were still crying and grinning, but just with tears this time. I could still see streaks of blood staining the front of their uniforms though. I was escorted back to my seat, where I spent the next several days. Days. Attendants continued to stop by with food. I would use the bathroom and soon was going absolutely crazy with the monotony. In retrospect, those few days weren't so bad. There's a lot of content on the internet after all, even with crappy plain Wi-Fi. No, it didn't get really bad until around 10 days later when the Wi-Fi failed. It was sometime a week later that I lost control and began screaming for a flight attendant. They didn't come for several minutes, but eventually one did. Just, just let me see the captain, I asked. The flight attendant bent low and spoke with that same customer service voice. I'm sorry sir, the captain has made his decision regarding you quite clear. He didn't answer his call and will, therefore, wait. How long? Quite a while I'm afraid. Don't worry though sir, we'll be landing in about an hour. She straightened and walked away. I started making notches on various parts of the seat back to keep track of different things. One notch for each time I used the bathroom, one for each meal, one for every time I watched a given movie, that sort of thing. It was hell. I watched every movie in the seat back a dozen times over. If I ever acted out badly enough, I would be escorted back to my seat by one or more flight attendants. Any attempt at conversation with other passengers was met with confusion by them followed by a quick escort back to my seat. I'd guess it was on or around day 30 that, in a moment of panic and psychosis, I broke my laptop and phone, screaming at the top of my lungs. No one around me reacted in any way. Two months later, I stunk. The muscles in my legs were tight and cramped constantly. I finally concluded that suicide was my only option after my 128 rewatch of Thor Ragnarok. I got to my feet and limped towards the emergency exit. I knew normally the pressure inside the airplane forced the doors closed, but I figured that nothing about my situation was normal. If this didn't work, I'd find some other more painful way to go. I grabbed at the handle and swung it up. To my shock, the door opened easily, though no wind of any kind whipped around the cabin. It remained the standard slightly too cold temperature that it had been for the past who knew how long. The open door called to me, a black portal out of the plane. I stared at it for a long moment, almost too long. An attendant's hand grabbed my shoulder, pulling me away. In a fit of anger and strength that surprised me, I wrenched away and jumped out of the plane. The wind whipping past my face was almost magical, a new sensation after so many months of the same. The ocean below me grew closer and larger, and I realized that suddenly, I didn't want to die after all. It grew larger and larger and larger until it seemed that all I could see was darkness and waves. I impacted the surface of the water so fast and hard that my entire body jerked around in the seat. I pulled my hand back, sucking at my bruised knuckle. I'd hit it on the seat in front of me. No, I whispered, then shouted. No, no, no. A flight attendant ran down the aisle, kneeling beside me. Are you okay, sir? I clenched my hands into fists, almost swinging at her. But then I realized, she wasn't grinning. She wasn't crying. To be honest, she looked a little scared of me. I reached my right hand down to my pocket where I could feel my now unbroken phone. 4.04 a.m. Sir, if you can calm down, will be landing in about an hour. My mouth tasted like ash. Thank you, I managed. I will. I stared unblinking at my phone. It now displayed 4.05 a.m. Then I looked out my window and began to cry at the sight of city lights below me. We did land in about an hour. I can't even begin to explain why or how, but I'm currently sitting in an airport cafe typing this out. I'm free. I'm out and I'm never going flying again. Edit, I sure hope the bartender here at the airport just has a naturally wide grin.
thank you to my super fans, Sweet Black Swan, Tacey, and Brooklyn. I really appreciate you guys supporting my channel, and I look forward to making more content for everyone.